The uh, flash crash occurred on May the 6th, 2010. Uh, during the morning, the stock market fell 3%, which is a very bad day for the stock market. Then, early in the afternoon, in the space of 10 minutes, the stock market fell another 5%, creating one of the worst days you'll ever see in the stock market. 10 minutes after that, the stock market had recovered, rising 5%, uh, back to where it was uh, before the flash crash started. We refer to that 20-minute period as the flash crash. There's been a huge amount of interest in the popular press and also you know, on Congress and in public policy circles in trying to understand why the flash crash occurred. Um, many people think that high frequency traders somehow contributed to the flash crash or caused the flash crash. Now, I had been working uh, at the Commodity Futures Trading Commission during this period uh, prior to the flash crash actually, studying the role of high frequency trading in the stock index futures market. The value of the S&P 500 is actually determined on a minute-by-minute -minute basis in the futures market, not in the uh, stock market that we think of as the New York Stock Exchange and NASDAQ and all of the other trading venues, but, but rather in the futures market. And with uh, other researchers at the uh, Commodity Futures Trading Commission, including Andre Kirilenko, who, Kirilenko, who is the main person um, uh, spearheading this project, um, we had been looking at what high frequency traders do on a typical day in the S&P 500 futures market. And what we've found is that high frequency trading is maybe 30% of the trading volume. It sounds very important. But in fact, the high frequency traders do not hold inventories for very long. They buy and they sell. Sometimes they buy and sell in the same second. Sometimes they'll buy and sell within milliseconds. And typically, they only hold their inventories for a couple of minutes. So. It's not going to be the case that the high frequency traders are going to cause a flash crash. And because they don't hold inventories for very long, they, they're not going to prevent a flash crash either. So what, actually, what we found actually happened on May the 6th, 2010, was that a very large trader came in and sold 75,000 contracts, about $4 billion uh, worth of uh, stock over a space of 20 minutes that corresponded exactly to the period of the crash, uh, flash crash. Um, initially, when that large $4 billion order hit the market, the high frequency traders bought uh, some of the um, $4 billion in, in stock that was being sold. But they didn't hold it for very long. They only hold it for a few seconds or, or for a minute or so. And then they started trying to get out of the inventory that they had acquired in buying it. As they tried to get out, they sold this inventory to other high-frequency traders, and those high-frequency traders, in turn, so sold it to other high-frequency traders. As a result, the trading volume in the uh, futures market skyrocketed. And the uh, high-frequency traders were trying to pass around futures contracts kind of like a hot potato uh, from one high-frequency trader to another. So did the high-frequency traders cause the flash crash? No. Did they exacerbate the flash crash? Well, t to the extent that they were trying to pass around these uh, futures contracts like a hot potato, they potentially exacerbated the flash crash a little bit. But one of the other things we discovered was that the algorithm that the large trader used to sell the 75,000 contracts was designed to be 9% of the trading volume during the period in which those contracts were to be sold. And because trading volume skyrocketed due to the hot potato effect, the uh, desire to be 9% of that trading volume made this large seller sell much faster than he would have sold if the trading volume had not skyrocketed. And as a result of that, the market, we think, plummeted much more quickly uh, than it would have plummeted otherwise. Um, but after 10 minutes, the market kind of figured out, hey, this is not some fundamental event that is happening in the market. This is instead uh, some uh, large, large transaction, perhaps, that's occurring in the futures market, and the market came roaring back. So the, the result of it was a V-shaped drop and recovery in, in stock prices that occurred in the futures market. Now, uh, the CFTC uh, engaged in a, a joint study with the SEC about the flash crash. Um, our, the results of our, our research were incorporated into the CFTC half of the study. Um, but the SEC half of the study was also very interesting. It studied what happened at the New York Stock Exchange and NASDAQ and the other trading venues that you have in the stock market. And what happened was some of those trading venues um, slowed down. Other trading venues stayed open. 
But in general, what was going on was because the futures market was dropping, arbitrageurs were buying futures contracts and turning around and selling stocks or selling exchange-traded funds into the market for the, where the actual stocks are traded. And they sold the exchange-traded funds and they sold the stocks so quickly that they depleted all the bids for many of the stocks that essentially existed in the entire market. And as a result, the, the bottom literally fell out of the market for individual stocks. You saw stocks fall all the way down to a price of one penny uh, and trade there, which turned out to be a kind of a scandal in and of itself. Um, and, uh, the, but the, we think that the reason that that, that occurred was uh, index arbitragers and other arbitragers buying the futures contracts that were plummeting and transferring that $4 billion of selling uh, into uh, the stock market to some extent. So um, at the, in the end of the day, uh, many of the trades at one penny, essentially all of those trades were reversed, and many of the other trades at ridiculously low prices were reversed. But it's left on the table, this issue of what is the role of high-frequency trading in all of this and, and what caused the flash crash. We think that high-frequency trading was an ingredient in the marketplace. It didn't really cause the flash crash. It also didn't prevent the flash crash. But that the way in which high-frequency trading interacted with the execution of this $4 billion stock sale did tend to exacerbate the flash crash um, because of the 9% of the volume that the um, large trader was trying to participate in. So the, the danger is that small investors got rattled. Uh, as a result of that, small investors have been reluctant to put money on the table in the stock market for long-term investing, and many small investors have taken money out of the stock market. It's difficult to say how much of this is due to the flash crash itself and how much of it is due just to the overall recession, but I think it's a distinct possibility that the income uncertainty that people feel because of layoff risk, the fact that people have been uh, losing money in their stock market investments already, already had people rattled. And when the flash crash occurred, uh, that got people even more upset, and so many uh, small retail investors are actually selling stocks, and those stocks are being bought typically by institutional investors um, to um, uh, replace the ownership of the individual investors. Now, whether the institutional investors will make a lot of money off of these purchases uh, is yet to be determined. The stock market has held up reasonably well, actually, um, in recent months, given how weak the economy is. Um, I think that when it comes to flash crash related issues, the futures market functioned quite well. Uh, they have a sophisticated electronic trading system. That sophisticated electronic trading system functioned essentially perfectly in the sense that it did exactly what it was designed to do. One of the things it's designed to do is to pause for five seconds if there's a huge order imbalance that will um, allow prices to drop by a, by a large amount instantaneously as a result of a large order being executed. And it did pause for five seconds right at the bottom of the flash crash. Um, and after that five second pause, um, the market came roaring back. That, that suggests that maybe it should have paused earlier and maybe the flash crash would have ended earlier, but it, it also suggests that, that maybe it, the, the, the futures market trading system worked very well. The stock market trading system uh, in the um, markets where the individual stocks uh, trade function very poorly. So we need to ask why did the futures market function so well and the market for the individual stocks function so poorly? And I, I think the answer to that is very clear. The futures market is an integrated market. There's basically one place at uh, the Globex uh, system at the Chicago Mercantile Exchange or the CME where the, where the futures contracts are all traded in, in one centralized market, which worked well. If you go to the markets for individual stocks, there are many, many different trading venues, dozens of different trading venues. It's very difficult for a customer who wants to buy to find the customer who wants to sell and trade directly with that customer without some intermediation um, occurring. And a lot of that intermediation occurs in the form of what we call flash, uh, uh, flash orders. Um, so what I think the solution to it is, is to have a much more centralized market for trading individual stocks. The um, SEC um, has something called the National Market System, which uh, as originally conceived was designed to uh, facilitate a, a central market where buyers and sellers could find one another very efficiently. I don't think it does it very efficiently. So what I would do is I would tilt the rules of the trading process a little bit to favor orders going into a primary listing exchange. And I would do that by impl implementing a rule that would say 
uh, any order that's going to be executed in the stock market has to be done at prices better than the prices available on the primary listing exchange. Otherwise, you have to do the order on the primary listing exchange at those better prices uh, that, that are on the primary listing exchange. How likely is it that something like that would happen? Well, it's not one of those things that is, uh, that is one of the formal proposals that's, that's under discussion. But the way I look at it, uh, everything is, is open for debate right now because the flash crash has kind of put on the table the whole market structure. And there are going to be congressional hearings taking place and different rules proposed. and different public policy um, agendas put forward and who knows what the result will be. But, but I hope it's a less fragmented market.